Hello and welcome to the 2017 Single Family Request for Proposal to Technical Assistance Webinar. This webinar will take about 45 minutes. Our Minnesota Housing's mission is, housing is the foundation for success, so we collaborate with individuals, communities, and partners to create, preserve, and finance affordable housing. Today's speakers are myself, I'm Nancy Slatstein, Nira, Nick, and Leanne. We hope you'll find this webinar informative, but if you have any questions, please call or email any one of us. Our contact information is found at the end of the webinar. In this webinar, we will cover an overview of the 2017 single family application, the anticipated funds for Minnesota Housing, and two co-funders, Metropolitan Council and the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund. We'll cover funding uses and types in the 2017 selection standards, funding priorities, and housing activities, as well as the application requirements and program guidelines. All applications and required attachments must be received by Minnesota Housing on or before Tuesday, June 13th at noon. This deadline applies to both electronic upload and one delivered hard copy. If you applied for the single family RFP in other years, last year or other years, we've used, we're using the same electronic submission process again this year. Upload all of your RFP and attachments to Minnesota Housing Single Family Secure File Exchange. The instructions are in the RFP guide and instructions that's posted on the Impact Fund webpage. Please read the guide carefully. So remember, your original RFP and all the attachments must be received by Minnesota Housing by noon on the 13th, not postmarked. All of the RFP materials are found on the Minnesota Housing's website at mnhousing.gov. Once on our homepage, click on Community Development under Lenders and Home Ownership Partners. Then click on Impact Fund at the top of this page. If you aren't familiar with the Impact Fund program, it is a, it's an umbrella name for all of the housing activities we offer through the RFP. You will help find it helpful if you read the program description, detailed program concept, the RFP timeline, and process guide and the Impact Fund Procedure Manual. You'll find the manual under the 2017 RFP selection. All of the 2017 RFP materials, co-funder materials, community profile, and methodologies are located within the 2017 Single Family RFP header. All other Impact Fund program information is found on this webpage too. Click on the plus sign and each section will open. Once you click on the 2017 RFP plus sign, you'll see the RFP materials below. All applicants are required to complete the general application section and the workbook. If you are a non-government or for-profit organization, you must complete the applicable organizational capacity and review form and submit the required attachments. You'll see that there are four housing activity sections, acquisition, rehab, resale, standalone affordability gap, new construction, and owner-occupied rehab. Each activity section has its own workbook. You only need to, to complete the housing activity section and workbook that is applicable to your proposal. You may apply for more than one activity, and if you do, you would only complete the activity section in that workbook, but you need to only complete one general application workbook. As you open each activity section and workbook, save it to your computer and click on Enable Editing. It's found at the top of the document. This will make the document fillable. At the end of each housing activity section, there is a list of required attachments. You must include all the attachments with your electronic and your hard copy. Minnesota Housing offers a few different funding resources. At this time, we don't know what the amounts will actually be. We'll publish the dollars available after the legislative session ends the end of May. 
We anticipate that we'll have challenge funds again. We assume that there will be an Indian set aside, but we'll have to see if there are bond proceeds. In addition to challenge funds, Minnesota Housing offers below market interest rate interim loans. This resource is specifically set aside for single family housing activities. So we'll announce the availability of funds as soon as we know what they are. Metropolitan Council plans to have $2.5 million available in total for single family and multifamily metro projects. And the Greater Minnesota Housing Fund plans to have $250,000 available for single family projects located in Greater Minnesota. Greater Minnesota Housing Fund has also provided a webinar available for viewing, which will be posted on the Impact Fund webpage. If you have questions about Met Council's local housing incentive account, please contact Ryan Kelly. His contact information, along with Greater Minnesota Housing Fund and a few other great resources and programs, are found on a slide at the end of this webinar. Another resource available is from Minnesota's Department of Corrections through their Institution Community Work Group Program. The Affordable Housing Building Program provides interest-free interim construction financing to nonprofit organizations in certain areas of the state. Contact Terry Byrne for more information about this program. The Impact Fund does have specific income limits. These are the 2016 income limits. The 2017 limits will be posted soon on our website. Always refer to the Impact Fund webpage for the most current limits. Note that these limits are not household gross incomes, and they're not that they are household gross incomes and not adjusted for family size. Your proposal can target a range of income limits as long as it doesn't exceed 115% of the state or area median income in your target area. If you're applying for another funding resource, their income limits may be slightly different, so you want to make sure you use the correct program limits. If you layer funding, you'll need to use the lesser limit. Now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Nira, who will talk to you about types of funds that are available. Thank you, Nancy. We have five types of funds available. We have grant funds, deferred loan funds, interim loans, housing infrastructure bond proceeds, and an Indian set aside. We provide grant funds for the activities of new construction and acquisition rehab resale. Grant funds may be used for value gap, which I will speak about in more detail in a little bit here. We provide deferred loans for affordability gap, and for owner-occupied rehabilitation. I'll talk a little bit about affordability gap in a bit here, too. Deferred loans are in the form of a no-interest, no-payment, 30-year loan. Repayment is required if the borrower no longer occupies the property as their principal place of residence, pays off their mortgage, or in 30 years. We also provide interim construction loans. Interim loans are available for construction financing for homes to be built or for rehabilitation activities. The interest rate is yet to be determined that will be below the market value interest rate. We may also have housing infrastructure bond proceeds. As Nancy mentioned, this will be up to the state legislature. These are only available on the single family side for community land trusts for land acquisition. We will also have an Indian set aside. We generally set aside a portion of our funds specifically for projects that will serve American Indian households. Value gap may be used for new construction and acquisition rehabilitation. It is the difference between the total development cost of a home and the appraised value. Value gap is available in the form of grants to bridge the cost of the project acquisition, improvement, or construction of a unit and the appraised value of the property. For example, the total development cost in a project may be $190,000. This includes the acquisition cost as well as the construction cost. The after-improved appraised fair market sales price is 
$30,000. There is a gap there of $30,000. We consider this a value gap and will provide grant funds to cover this difference. We also provide affordability gap. As mentioned, affordability gap is used for down payment assistance and closing cost assistance. Affordability gap is needs-based. Each buyer's financial situation is different, and therefore, each affordability gap loan is different. Here's an illustration of how affordability gap works. The purchase price of a home is $140,000. But the first mortgage that a buyer can afford is only $135,000. There is a gap there of $5,000, which we consider the affordability gap. We can provide deferred loan funds to cover this $5,000 for the home buyer. Nick will go over affordability gap and other requirements related to this in a little bit later in the webinar. Another note on affordability gap. If you are a nonprofit and you are planning to provide financing to FHA borrowers, you must be HUD approved and you must appear on HUD's nonprofit organization roster. If the first mortgage is an FHA mortgage, you should not assign the loan to Minnesota Housing until FHA insurance is in place. In the RFP application, we will ask you whether you are, non you are on the nonprofit organization roster. We will expect an explanation if you are not. Here's a visual of how value gap and affordability gap work. As you can see, value gap is the difference between the total development cost and the fair market value of a property. Affordability gap is the difference between the purchase price, which should be the same as the fair market value, and the amount of first mortgage that the borrower can afford. We also provide interim loans. Interim loans may be paired with a primary construction lender, or it may also be the only source of construction financing. It may be used to lower the loan-to-value ratio of a construction loan from another lender. You may use our interim construction loan with our value gap or affordability gap funding as well. The interest starts to accrue on the construction financing loan when the funds are dispersed to you. The interest accrues until the loan is repaid. The interest rates may vary from year to year, but it is, again, typically below the market rate. Repayment generally takes place when the home is sold to the buyer, but you can also repay earlier without a penalty. Now, Nick will share with you more details about the RFP process and scoring. Hello, Nick Fetcher here. So, after you finish all your hard work and submit your application, it's our turn to carefully review and score each one. The RFP review team brings the proposals to a large selection committee at the end of August. Proposals are discussed and scored by this committee, which is made up of various staff from Minnesota Housing and our partners. Proposals scoring poorly on any of these three selection standards may not receive funding. Minnesota Housing's Board approved the 2017 scoring criteria at our March board meeting. Now, these criteria are posted to the Impact Fund webpage in a document called Scoring Metrics and include the number of points corresponding with each scoring criterion. We take a variety of criteria into account, but organizational capacity, project feasibility, and community need are critical. So mostly scoring criteria have stayed the, stayed the same from 2016. Uh, service to rural or tribal designated communities, which includes all areas of the state, 
outside of the Twin Cities, Duluth, St. Cloud, and Rochester accounts for one-third more points than it did last year. If you'll recall, several years ago, greater Minnesota rural and tribal areas were considered for community economic integration points and are now considered under their own criterion. So here's an example of how it might work in practice. So a new construction project in Candy, Ojai County, Lake of the Woods County, or Crow Wing County would receive four points under the rural or tribal designated areas criterion and no points under the economic integration criterion. While that same project in much of Duluth, Rochester, St. Cloud, Cottage Grove, West Bloomington, or St. Paul Thailand Park would receive no points under the rural or tribal designated areas criterion and three points under the economic integration criterion. So of the uh, selection standards, uh, which are those critical standards I mentioned earlier, uh, first is organizational capacity. We look at a variety of things when we look at organization capacity, including uh, whether you have housing experience with similar projects, who the applicant's partners are, and what their experience is. Examples of partners might be a, a developer, a contractor, lending partners, home buyer education counselors, marketing or real estate agents. You'll need to address the roles that you as the applicant and your partners each will play. You've been funded in the past through the single family RFP. We'll also be reviewing your past performance and reporting under the impact fund. We also review the financial strength of your organization. If you applied in the past, you're probably familiar with the organizational capacity review form. Uh, complete the form as applicable to you and submit the required attachments. There's a form for nonprofits and a different one for for profit entities. Government agencies and tribal governments do not need to complete this form. The form should be completed by your organization's finance manager, accountant, or executive director. Uh, the purpose of it is to help us assess your organization's financial position and to see if we might need to provide additional technical assistance uh, in administration of the funds. Missing or incomplete documentation may not be considered for funding, so it's important to complete the form and submit the required documents. Next up is uh, project feasibility. So we'll be considering what the market conditions are in your area and whether it's economically viable to complete the project there. We'll be looking to see that uh, the project's development costs are reasonable, uh, as is the uh, total per unit investment. We'll look to see that the project can be completed in 20 months, which is the award term allowed by law. We'll also be considering whether your project is development ready. For example, do you have site control or will you be able to acquire sites in the near future? Do you have building plans and specifications or uh, plans in place to develop scopes of work or rehabilitation? Have you thought about your target population? Perhaps you have a list of potential home buyers ready to purchase a home or a list of homeowners you've identified with home improvement needs. You can reference this information in your application. If impact fund dollars won't fill the entire gap of a project, you have other committed sources of funding in place. All these things are taken into account uh, when we look at development readiness. Um, next up is community need. It's important to align your housing activity with market conditions and housing needs in the target area. For example, if you propose a new construction project, you need to explain the need for new construction in the target area, uh, for example, uh, and consider whether the area has a large stock of existing for sale housing inventory. Consider what the population in your target area wants or needs. You might explain what other programs exist in the area and how your proposal differs from those or complements these programs. And finally, consider whether there's a gap in coverage in your area and how your proposal best meets otherwise unmet needs. These are all things to think about in regards to community. Special niche has become increasingly important in the application review. 
If you're applying for funds for affordability gap or owner-occupied rehabilitation, you'll need to address the extent to which other programs are available to meet the same needs and what special niche your proposal addresses which cannot be met by other programs. It's unlikely that the agency will fund standalone down payment assistance or owner-occupied rehabilitation proposals unless these proposals meet a special niche. There are also Minnesota housing programs for owner-occupied rehab in addition to programs that our co-funder partners offer. Our goal is to avoid duplicating existing programs. One good example of a program that makes effective use of other available resources is the Community Fix-Up Initiative. You could propose to offer a community fix-up initiative in partnership with a Minnesota housing fix-up lender. Through this initiative, you could use impact fund grant dollars to write down interest rates on fix-up loans, which borrowers could then use to improve their homes. An approved lender and a community partner may team up to provide services and or funds in conjunction with fix-up loans to further increase affordability by writing down or discounting the interest rate and provide an incentive for homeowners home improvement projects. We've seen this used very effective recently. Effectively recently. Uh, community fix-up proposals are viewed favorably under the special niche criterion. The bottom line is to please look into all available existing programs prior to accessing impact fund dollars. Our funding priorities are uh, responsive to two sources the legislation, and Minnesota housing strategic priorities. Uh, so, so far I've covered some of the most important scoring selection standards, including organizational capacity, feasibility, and community need, which are threshold criteria. As I mentioned before, those proposals which do not meet a threshold in any one of those areas do not advance for funding consideration. And next I'll focus on some of these funding, other funding priorities. Leverage accounts for 13% of the total score. In general, the more leverage, the better. Amount of leverage is given greater weight than the diversity of sources, but both are important. Amount is considered from two perspectives, as a share of the project's total development cost and as a ratio of impact fund leverage to other sources of leverage. Committed leverage is critical. The more committed leverage, the better. Leverage show us that others feel your activity is viable and are willing to share in the risk. We want to see project-specific leverage rather than non-project-specific leverage. Project-specific means that someone's donating materials or money to a specific project or program, while non-project-specific might include other operational support, like funds contributed to your organization for general operations, but which hasn't been dedicated either by the funder or your organization to a specific project for which you are requesting impact fund dollars. You could decide to take formal action to dedicate uncommitted funding to a specific project or program, thus making it project specific. Something to think about is whether you have a contingency plan for uh, if, you're pending, if your pending leverage sources fall through. You'll need to complete the leverage worksheet in each activity workbook. And don't forget to attach current commitment letters. Committed leverage is a known dollar amount specifically dedicated to the project or program and that has been approved by the funder. To receive points, you must provide acceptable documentation such as commitment letters approving funds for that project or program. The commitment letters must be signed and dated. The funding amount dedicated to the project and the time period that is available must be included. Dedicated funds within a multi-year board approved strategic plan or budget is also acceptable. As an example of uh, pending leverage, you've applied or will be applying to another funder for funds for your proposed activity but those funds have not yet been approved. Or you've, uh, you have dedicated existing funds to the project or program in your budget, but that budget has not yet been formally approved. All leverage must be committed to be counted and to receive points. 
In other words, there is no correlation between the amount or diversity of pending leverage and your leverage score. That said, pending leverage can support the feasibility of a project, so you should still include proof of pending leverage. You also have the ability to turn pending leverage into committed leverage up until August 1st. Leverage commitments received by then will be considered in scoring the application. This is an, yet another reason to include proof of pending leverage in your application for funds. Reaching underserved populations is an important goal of Minnesota Housing. We still emphasize organizations' past performance in the uh, impact fund application and reaching underserved households. But we also want to hear about your plans to reach underserved populations, defined as single-headed households, households of color and Hispanic ethnicity, and households with a person with a disability moving forward. We score a number of priorities based largely on geographic data. For more information on these, see links to the Community Profiles tool and scoring methodology documents on our Impact Fund webpage. At this time, I'll turn it over to Leanne McKenzie to round out the, uh, the uh, presentation. Thanks, Nick. If you're awarded deferred loan funds, Minnesota Housing provides the legal documents to the administrator for the borrower to sign at closing, and the administrator closes the deferred loan in its name, records the mortgage documents, and assigns the mortgage to Minnesota Housing for servicing. Minnesota Housing current servicer is a Marinette. Repayment is triggered upon property sale or transfer and the date of repayment of the first mortgage if co-terminus with the deferred loan, if the borrower no longer occupies the property, or in 30 years, which is the end of the term. We expect that in most cases, the applicant to the impact fund who becomes the administrator under the impact fund agreement will originate its own deferred loan if awarded deferred loan funds. However, we also recognize that for various reasons, an administrator may choose to have another entity originate loans. Accordingly, we allow administrators to retain processing entities with which we require that the administrator have a contractual relationship. We also stress that the administrator, not the processing entity, retains responsibility for performing under the impact fund award. Minnesota Housing will require successfully funded impact fund applicants undertaking new construction or acquisition rehabilitation resale activities to comply with the 2015 Green Communities criteria and the current Minnesota Housing overlay. Green Communities requirements do not apply to owner-occupied rehabilitation programs or if only affordability gap is requested with impact fund dollars. We want to stress how important it is to have established community partnerships to help you strengthen your application. If you are a new applicant, you should seek partners who have had past impact fund awards so they can be your advisor if you run into issues down the road. Your applications will look stronger if you have already identified realtors, lenders, and contractors that you will work with on the project to demonstrate your team has been assembled. Make sure all the information is consistent across the narrative, charts, and financial worksheets. Your general application workbook should add up to the same request amount in your activity-specific workbook. We understand that some organizations have someone writing the narrative and another staff member is filling out the financials. Just make sure they are consistent. Here are additional application tips. Use the checklist found on the first tab of the general workbook. Remember to attach the required documents at the end of each activity-based section. And ensure consistency, consistency between financial worksheet and application information. 
As mentioned before, the single family RFP is due on June 13th at noon. That means your application, workbook, and all attachments must be received both in hard copy and electronic by Minnesota Housing no later than noon. Minnesota Housing's funding recommendations will be presented to our board tentatively on October 19th. The Met Council and Greater Minnesota Housing Fund Board meeting dates may be different. Those funding will be posted on Minnesota Housing's website after all boards meet. If funded by Minnesota Housing, you'll receive a notification letter in early November. If you are funded through a co-funder, you'll hear from them separately. We will schedule debriefings with applicants who are not funded shortly after the awards are announced. Impact fund agreements are sent out late November, early December, and no disbursements will be made until contracts are signed and returned and intended method forms are submitted and approved. Throughout the contract term, you'll be required to complete ongoing reports, program monitoring, and audited. We have several recorded webinars posted under the trainings link of the Impact Fund website. We also have a special instructional guide about the affordability gap application section. Here are the co-funder partner contact information. If you have any questions, here's the single family RFP contact information. This concludes the single family RFP technical assistance webinar. Thank you.